this is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and today we're looking at the Samsung Series 7 Ultra. This is Samsung's new touchscreen Ultra Bug. It's really cool, too. At price between, well, obviously the Samsung Series 5 and the Samsung Series 9, this is still one of my favorites. You get a solid Ultra Bug of three, three, a little over three pounds in weight, touchscreen full 1080p, removable bottom, and you can actually upgrade the RAM and the hard drive, something that's unusual for an Ultra Bug. We're going to look at it now. So this is the Samsung Series 7 Ultra. Really nice looking design. This is a 13.3 inch Ultrabook. This one has Intel Core i5 ULV CPU. That's the new 1.8 gigahertz, 3337 U. So a little bit of a speed bump over the older Core i5s that we've seen very recently still in Ultrabooks. But first let's take a look at the design here. Nice brushed aluminum casing. Looks good. Uh, Samsung has finally been listening to folks who have been complaining about the plastic look on some of their products. Maybe the phones will even change someday soon, but not the plasticky stuff that we see on the Series 5. Not quite as high styling as that Samsung Series 9 Ultrabook, but we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Still a nice looking computer. A little bit of plastic right here for your improved antenna reception. Good thinking, Samsung. We like that. Slim all around, not much of a taper. And uh, compared to the Series 9, which has the very sculpted size, sides that some manufacturers have even copied, this is pretty much just straightforward right here. So you're not getting the super sophisticated design elements that you do on the Series 9, but you do get some other good stuff instead. And also a pretty affordable price tag. The one that we're looking at is the Best Buy model, $9.99 for this, so not bad at all. Anyway, on the side here you can see our ports, and we have a special little thing right here. This is a gigabit Ethernet jack. Drop down a little plastic thing there since the port's thick otherwise. So nice to have that. Pretty rare on Ultrabooks and business users always appreciate having wired Ethernet. We have a full-size HDMI port. No little micro HDMI port. No little adapters required there. USB 3.0 port right there. There's your combo headphone microphone jack. And this is the little VGA, micro VGA port, and that requires a separately sold adapter, the full-size VGA. Front, pretty much just clean lines, a little lip to grab it by to open it up, make it easy. This side here, under a door, we have our SD card slot right there. Two USB 2.0 ports. Now, three USB ports is pretty unusual on an Ultrabook. Usually you see two, sometimes only even one. Now, why they went with two USB 2.0s and only one 3.0, I don't know. But then again, most of the time, you're plugging in keyboards, mice. Uh, those are USB 2.0 peripherals anyway. It doesn't really matter. So the 3.0 port on the other side, you're going to want to use with your USB 3.0 hard drives and hard speed, high speed peripherals like that. And we have our little Kensington lock slot over here. What's neat about the bottom, all metal brushed aluminum here, nice ventilation holes. JBL speakers right here, 2 watts a piece, 4 watts total, very nice sound. Above average for an Ultrabook, certainly beats my ASUS ZenBook Prime UX31A touch. But there are just 10 Phillips head screws here. You don't need some obscure Torx screwdriver here. You can unscrew this, open it up, and by the way, this is a metal bottom here, but there's a little plastic attached, kind of fused to the, the metal underneath here, that serves as a bunch of grippy clips. So if you are taking this off, it's very easy to start prying from the front, and you'll have to be using something like a credit card to carefully pry along here to free up the plastic that is attached to the metal there. But once you open it up, two RAM slots inside, standard SO DIMMs. This uses 1600 MHz DDR3 RAM, so that means that you can bring this all the way up to 16 gigs of RAM, which is just about unheard of in an Ultrabook. Very nice there. And it has an MSATA SSD drive. Standard shape, standard size, nothing obscure there. And of course, Samsung uses their own PM841, which is a good SSD in there. So it's highly upgradable. And in that way, it competes with the ASUS ZenBook UX32 model, which has discrete graphics as an option. Although, as I said, this is the Best Buy one. It doesn't. But if you do get the overseas one, and maybe it'll make it here eventually, you can get AMD Radeon 8570 HD graphics, which is a, a lower-end graphics card. You really can't fit much of a powerful graphics card in an Ultrabook. It's comparable to the, uh, the GT NVIDIA 620M that's used in the ZenBook UX32 VD. But anyway... Much more upgradable than your average Ultrabook. Good going there. Nice design inside. And it also has a beefy battery because, well, just in case you get the one with dedicated graphics. But if you don't, boy, it's a real boon because with Intel HD 4000 graphics, this guy just runs quite a long time. And for a touchscreen Ultrabook, usually those have not had really great battery life so far. So far, I'm having 
good luck going at least six hours on a charge with this guy. And so you can see just what it looks like inside. We're going to slice in a couple of pictures so you can see what the internals are like on this in case you want to upgrade it yourself. So here's what we see inside. Good looking Ultrabook, full 1080p touchscreen right here. Responsive, works well. 350 nits of brightness. Samsung doesn't say what the technology is. I assume it's their usual PLS technology. Very wide IPS-like viewing angles here. Sharp, nice colors, good saturation. The one thing that's annoying about it is, you know Samsung and their ambient light sensors, if you've used Samsung products before, overbearing, overkill. Even when I shut off Windows own setting of display brightness uh, in your general settings right here you can get to that option it was still doing it so then I went into the Intel HD 4000 graphics to look at it there and then I had to go and look at Samsung settings where they don't actually have a setting there anyway I had to ch turn it up any place that I could find it and then reboot the machine to actually start to get full control over brightness otherwise it likes to get really dim I mean the Sun comes through in the window for a minute and you see the brightness shifting it's just yeah you get the idea anyway it can be disabled folks so good looking screen, we have our 720p webcam up here, we have our ambient light sensor, we have microphone as well. And if you take a look at the keyboard, they really do a great job of making use of all the space. I'm thrilled that they didn't inset the keyboard and put a giant surround around it and reduce the size of the keyboard keys. So big and roomy, nice, very big trackpad. This is an Elan trackpad, not my favorite often, but you know what? It, it actually works pretty well, so I'm not going to complain. And the size is very good on it as well. And I like the little ring around here so you actually feel when you've wandered off the trackpad. So you can see normal keyboard layout up here. You use the FN key to control the FN functions up here for things like your keyboard backlight. Yes, this has a backlit keyboard, your brightness, your volume. And also you can set it between quiet mode or not. You've got a little fan symbol right here and you can enable and disable wireless. This has dual band Intel wireless with Wi-Di as well as Bluetooth 4.0. You can see we have our power button right here, sculpted inset a little bit. It's hard to see but there are fan intakes right over here in that area. We have a power indicator and a charging indicator, a little JBL, JBL branding over there. And if you take a look from the side you can see that it has a sort of neat Samsung and Sony both do this, a kind of sculpting. So the wrist rest area is raised a little bit and it drops down. It's a visually pleasing design element that makes it look more expensive and also it's more ergonomic. You can see the keys are not very tall here. They have a reasonable amount of travel for an Ultrabook. And the funny thing with a Samsung keyboards is I never like the way they feel so much, but I always type like a wizard on them. So it's actually a good keyboard to type on, but I, it doesn't feel as mm, feedback wise pleasing. And the deck itself is very firm. It doesn't trampoline. If you press hard, you can get just the slightest bit of movement here, but hardly anything at all. So a good keyboard to type on. My one complaint with Samsung keyboards, as always, is the silver design here. Well, it looks awful pretty, doesn't it? But then you have the key masking, which in the best of light, like we have right now, looks pretty distinct. But if you have this in kind of eh, lighting, indoor lighting, not very bright, this masking is not very dark because it's going to have white backlight that shines through so they couldn't make those black becomes hard to see and in some cases the backlight actually makes it even harder to see when you get white backlight against light silver there's just not much contrast there the display tilts back this far and that's reasonably far we're not going to go flat here I often wonder what the point is of notebooks that actually open completely flat but that's plenty enough viewing angle especially for something that has very very wide viewing angles you're going to find a comfort zone most likely with something that can go this far back Looks good for most any angle. Again, not as complex a design maybe as the ZenBook Prime with its keen taper look, or the Samsung Series 9 Ultrabook, which has those neat sculpted sides, but still quite good looking. Why is this a little bit thicker on the front? Why does it have less taper? Well, because they wanted to make for the upgradable parts here and make room for the dedicated graphics card if you have that option. So I think that's a very worthwhile trade-off here because you have something that is upgradable and potentially you can get it with dedicated graphics even. The hinge on this is quite stiff which is a good thing because when you're poking at the screen to do things you don't want it wobbling all around on you hopefully it'll stay stiff it's a very nice beefy looking hinge so no complaints there this weighs three pounds and six ounces so it's not one of the very lightest 13 inch ultra books on the market usually touch screens add about 200 grams of weight so it's within about two ounces of the ZenBook Prime Touch by the way and still a very portable package but a little extra weight there and also the extra room inside of the chassis and the extra parts, the, the RAM sockets, believe it or not, those actually add weight on. So it's going to weigh a little bit more. 
the full HD display, you can see that they've set up, so you got the, the five tiles up and down, that's fine by me. They set desktop zooming at 125%, but I've dropped that back down 100%, so things are looking kind of tiny there. 125% is probably best for most folks, so that, well, in 13 inches, that's a lot of resolution, otherwise the screen in there, and your icons are pretty teeny, your text is pretty small. Of course, you can set zooming inside of applications independently, including IE. In terms of performance, you can see our Windows Experience Index scores here on a scale of 1 to 9.9. This is Windows 8, 64-bit. And our processor is a 6.9, memory is a 7.2, desktop graphics 4.7, 3D graphics 6.2, and primary hard disk, which is the Samsung SSD drive, scores 7.8. Good, respectable stuff. On PC Mark 7, it scored 4418. This, again, is the 1.8 GHz Core i5-3337U. I expected it actually to score a little bit higher since it has that slightly newer, slightly faster CPU and a good Samsung SSD drive, but still that's within range of competing Ultrabooks and it's just fine. Samsung does load a lot of custom software on here. Some of it's pretty useful. Samsung's own updaters and computer maintenance stuff and a lot of other junk, to be honest, that, well, I would delete and probably improve performance. You get Norton Internet, Internet Security 60-day trial on here. You can always use Windows Security Essentials, which is pretty lightweight and built into the operating system as an option. They have something that's from the folks who used to be known as Disk Keeper that's supposed to improve your disk caching, and that makes sense for conventional spinning hard drives, but not so much on an SSD drive, another thing I would whack. And we have a whole lot of Samsung applications that, especially if you've used previous Samsung notebooks, are more likely their tablets and phones where we've seen this kind of software. We have S-Camera instead of just using the regular camera application. Now this only has a front camera, so how much photography or videography you're going to do with the front camera. Probably just going to stick to Skype where it does a good job, but just in case we have S Camera. We have S Player, which is their own video player. We have S Gallery, another photo viewer. Of course, all these functions are also available with Windows built-in applications. Samsung Signature Store, that's where they're going to convince you that you just got to have a Samsung camera and a Samsung TV to go along with this. Kindle's on here, Netflix is on here, Evernote Touch, a couple of games that are available free on the Windows Store anyway. Some more bloatware that I actually already removed, but we've got Fresh Paint on board. HP Printer Control comes from Windows 8's clever way of going on the network and finding our HP printer that was not pre-installed. And they give you a copy of Adobe Photoshop Elements. However, this is the, the trial edition, so it's actually not one that comes with the software keys. And it's uh, 2.9 gigs. It's a rather large application. If you don't want or if you have full Photoshop, you're probably going to ax that too. Speaking of space, on our hard drive right here, we have installed Office on here, just a couple of small applications, and we're already down to 52.8 gigs of storage. That's out of 128 gig SSD. Obviously, if, if you get rid of Photoshop Elements, well, you're going to gain some space there, and if you want to take the recovery partition and put it on a USB flash drive, you can gain about 10 gigs as well. One thing I should note is I've already upgraded this to 8 gigs of RAM, so the hibernation partition is twice the size. That's using up some space. Otherwise, we'd have about another 4 or 5 gigs. As I mentioned, so far, battery life has been stellar with this. Now, again, this is the model with Intel HD 4000 integrated graphics. If you have the one with dedicated graphics and you make use of those graphics, well, you're going to get less battery runtime. And we're going to continue to run tests, so be sure to look at our full written review when it's available to see how we ended up faring with this. But right now, I'd say you're probably going to get at least six hours out of this guy. It has a pretty beefy 57 watt per hour four cell battery inside, sealed inside obviously, though if you unscrew the bottom plate you can get to it, so it's not completely unserviceable. And it comes with a very compact standard notebook style charger, it's a 60 watt charger, nice length of cord, not big at all, quite small, so it keeps the whole package very portable. Now since this is a full Windows 8 computer and pretty capable CPU, even with the Intel HD 4000 integrated graphics right here, we've got Photoshop Elements up. You can run Photoshop Elements, you can use development software, you could certainly use MS Office, play 1080p video, obviously natively on the 1080p screen. So it's very capable and fast performer. Uh, you can even do some HD video editing with this. Personally, I would pick something even more powerful if I was going to do that for hours on end. But it, yeah, for those of you who are just doing this casually or occasionally, no problem with doing that kind of thing. Certainly capable computer. So now we want you to hear those JBL speakers, and you can see 1080p video playback. This is an MPEG-4 high bitrate movie trailer, and we have the volume set at 68%, and it's really very nice and loud and full.
can't tell anyone. I know. I understand you have concerns about our cargo. Colonel, there isn't anything else that I should know, is there? I can assure you the answer is no. Good and full, and trust me, when we get to the part where the explosions start, it's really loud. The only complaint I have about this screen is it's quite glary, and using it in a bright room when you're watching a movie can be a little bit distracting. You can admire your own teeth if you want to. So, yeah, try not to use this guy in bright light. It is a glossy screen. Now, this is an Ultrabook. Obviously, it's not going to be a dedicated gaming machine monster if you get the HD 4000 one. Honestly, even if you get the one with the dedicated AMD Radeon 8570 HD graphics, that's still a lower and dedicated graphics card that will help a little bit. Certainly, it's going to help if you're doing some video editing, if you want to speed up image editing, and it can make some games more playable. For example, we tried Bioshock Infinite, and you really have to drop it down to 1366 by 768 resolution and use the lowest quality settings to run on this. Now if you're playing some older games or less demanding games like Left 4 Dead 2, that seems to run nicely in just about everything. It runs just fine. So, In terms of heat, we worry a little bit when you have a metal bottom here, you know, it, it, it can transfer some heat, but good ventilation here, good isolation actually from the CPU. There's some good heat sink copper stuff going on in here. We took it apart and took a look does not get too hot to the touch. Even when playing games, it never exceeded body temperature, and that's usually the indicator for whether something's going to be comfortable or not. And the top is nice and cool to the touch. CPU temperatures range anywhere from 35 to 50 degrees centigrade. That's perfectly fine and normal. Uh, it's allowed to go all the way up to 105 degrees before we have a thermal overload event going on. Obviously, there's temperature management that stops that from ever happening, but you have plenty of leeway here. Runs cool. Fan noise? What fan noise? Uh, honestly, when doing productivity work here, when working in, in Word, or even when using Photoshop, I don't hear the fan. When streaming Netflix video, maybe the slightest little just whirr, you know, like, you know it's alive, that kind of thing. I play Bioshock, you'll hear the fan then, but that's to be expected. That's true of any computer on the planet. So also very quiet. Nice stuff. All in all, Samsung did a great job here bringing in an Ultrabook at a pretty reasonable price. For $9.99, this is a nice Ultrabook. Now, we don't know what the model with dedicated graphics is going to cost, or which potentially might have an Core i7 CPU in it. That one might get expensive, but so far, price-wise, obviously, it's, it's between the Series 5 and the Series 9, and closer to the Series 9 in terms of pricing. Though Some of those Series 9s can get quite expensive. There are budget ones that are pretty low spec for close to $999, but going all the way up to about $1,800, and those do not have touch screens. So if you want a touch screen with Windows 8, which, gosh, you probably do because it's much easier and much more fun to use it, this is your choice right now. So that's the Samsung Series 7 Ultrabook. It's available now overseas and in the U.S. with the U.S. I think Best Buy seems to have the exclusive right now. You can get it with dedicated graphics overseas. You can get it with integrated graphics here, and that's the affordable version. Either way, it's a really nice product. Be sure to read our full written review on mobiletechreview.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit that like button too.